Okay, uh, let's start today's lecture. Uh, uh, thank you for attending. Uh, today's uh, speaker is Bernard Carr and Florian Kuhner. Uh, here discuss about primordial black holes as dark matter candidates. Please start. Right, thank you. Well, I, I am Bernard Carr and uh, I will be giving the first part of this lecture course. Um, we, we're giving four lectures, two today and two on Thursday. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll meet Florian Kunell um, in the second lecture today. Um, it is a, a great honor to be talking um, to you all. Um, I should say that the lectures which we're going to give are, very, are based very closely on some lectures we gave at a summer school in Les Ouches last summer. And indeed, if you want to, uh, if you want to see the write-up of those lectures, I've given the archive number here on the first slide. And and in particular, uh, we we won't be giving lots of references in these lectures, but all the lectures, all the references, um, are given in the write-up uh, in that archive paper. So let me now go on to the. Uh, second slide, I thought I would start off by mentioning the fact that although we've been studying primordial black holes for uh, almost 50 years, I mean, I, I wrote my first paper on the subject in 1974, which is nearly 50 years ago, um, it was a minority interest for um, a long period. Um, but in the last five years, the topic has really become almost mainstream. And of course, that's uh, very exciting. Uh, we, I've listed here the number of papers on the topic uh, since, well, my, the first paper in 74 um, as a function of time. And you can see it was always pretty modest, for, really, until about 2014. And uh, there was a little peak at about uh, when Hawking discovered Hawking radiation, which is associated with primordial black holes. By the way, primordial black holes will always be abbreviated as PBH. Um, and then really, primary because of probably because of the detection of gravitational waves by LIGO, um, this has caused a huge boost uh, of interest in primordial black holes. So for example, in the period up to 2021, there were something like 500 papers. And actually, uh, for someone like myself, who I'm often asked to give review papers, review talks on the on the subject. It's becoming almost impossible to keep up with the uh, the literature anymore. Um, and uh, in in a way, I it was easier for me when no one believed in them because there weren't so many papers on the topic. But obviously, I'm pleased that now people are taking the subject seriously because um, otherwise, I, I I devoted fifty years of my life to the subject. So if they don't exist, I've sort of wasted a lot of my life. So I'm quite pleased. This, of course, about this increase of interest, um, and um, I, I, and I, keeping it rather personal, it, it's also quite interesting. My my first paper ever was in nineteen seventy four with Stephen Hawking, um, and this paper has now become my most cited paper. It's nearly a thousand citations, but again, you can see that the number of citations is very low. But since the uh, uh, the 2015 or something, uh, the number of citations has soared, and um, are reflecting, of course, the fact the topics become mainstream. My my second paper was on my own, and that paper um, ha has also had uh, nearly a thousand references, a few fewer. But again, you see the same peak, um, and of course, in a way. It, I, I, my first paper are the most my most cited paper, and in a way that's rather depressing because it suggests that my career has been downhill ever since. However, there is some good news from my personal point of view because um, Florian and my um, wrote a paper with um, that in in two thousand and sixteen on again primordial black holes as dark matter, the theme of this meeting. And uh, and that actually has had uh, 750 citations. So that's probably my uh, next most cited paper. So um, it's good that and, and now I've just retired. Actually, I'm now emeritus. So it, it's it's quite good. My career it might might have been downhill from the start, but it's had a little resurgence. <laughs> now I've retired, which is quite good. 
Um, now, the plan of the lectures, we, we've got two sets of lectures. I'm going to start off by giving an overview and historical introduction, which will be rather general. Um, uh, I'm then going to address briefly the question of whether PBHs can be the dark matter, because that's something, obviously, which that's the theme of the lectures. Um, I'm then going to make some remarks about why primordial black holes make an important link between macro and microphysics. Um, and then in the second half of this morning's lectures, Florian will take over and he will talk about the formation of primordial black holes. And then he's going to talk about the constraints on primordial black holes, which at least until recently was where most of the emphasis was, because there wasn't really any direct evidence for primordial black holes until, um, well, maybe with the, the, the LIGO events. Um, so most of the emphasis on the subject till a few years ago was on constraints. And so Florian will be talking about that. In the second lecture, uh, second set of lectures on Thursday, I will continue the discussion of constraints, but then I will return to the question of PBHs of dark matter. I'll be I'll be sort of saying much more about that. Um, but actually, what's interesting about primordial black holes is not just they can provide the dark matter. Obviously, that's the key interest. But but there's many other cosmic conundrums they can solve, and and uh, Florian in well, in his lecture on that day will we'll talk about how there's a very natural scenario in which primordial black holes can actually solve a lot of cosmic conundra. Um, then, because I understand that this is a, a, a mixed audience of particle physicists and cosmologists, we, we will talk about the question of is the dark matter actually primordial black holes or some elementary particle candidate, which in some senses, among particle physicists at least, is the most popular uh, solution and and we will argue in fact it's probably um it, it probably some combination and which makes it very interesting and now uh, finally i will make some final points so this is the plan of lectures um, as i say these lectures are based very much on the lectures we gave at les Ouches. so if any of you were at les Ouches, i'm afraid you'll be very bored so it's, <laughs> maybe you shouldn't carry on but hopefully the audience is is rather distinct now um so let me start off with the overview and historical introduction. So um, I'm going to, first of all, I think you're all aware that there is tremendous evidence for primordial, for, for black holes in general. Um, we know that stars in the mass range, say 10 to 100, they leave black holes, which I will refer to as stellar black holes. Um, for example, the first detection was of Cygnus X1. It was an X-ray binary. Obviously, you can't see an individual black hole because it's dark, but if it's in a binary system, it can accrete and glow. And, and the first example of that was Cygnus X1 in about, I think, 1973. Um, but of course, most recently, uh, the LIGO, well, in, LIGO originally detected gravitational waves from coalescing black holes, about 30 solar masses. Now, of course, there are many more detections, and it's LIGO and Virgo and CAGRA. Um, um, and so, uh, really, there is no doubt that stellar black holes do exist. But there's also, I would say, overwhelming evidence for supermassive black holes in, in the galactic nuclei, AGN, active galactic nuclei. Um, and even when they're not active. And, and the mass range of those black holes is enormous. It goes from something like a million to 10 to the 11 solar masses. So for example, the Milky Way has got a 4 million solar mass black hole. Um, quasars are typically powered by 10 to the 8 solar mass black holes. This is almost you know, universally agreed that this is the, the most likely explanation. The biggest black hole is seven times 10 to the 10 solar masses, you know, nearly 100 billion solar masses. So it's it's amazing. And, and what's interesting is that it looks as though almost every galaxy has got a central black hole. And there, is, and there is this link between the mass of the black hole. You can't see it very clearly. This is the mass of the black hole versus the mass of the galaxy, the stellar mass. And there's this nice linear relationship and uh, and so the existence of these black holes is, is really, I would say, incontroversial. Now, there are also intermediate mass black holes, possibly between, say, 1,000 and 100,000, which, of course, is in intermediate between these two ranges. Um, I would say the evidence for that is not quite so conclusive. Uh, these IMBH stands for intermediate massive black holes. SMBH stands for supermassive black holes. 
Um, for example, there are ultra-luminous X-ray sources, and here's one which is uh, it's in the edge of the galaxy. This is a spiral galaxy. The little source is there, and that probably has a 500 solar mass black hole. Uh, some globular clusters may have uh, intermediate mass black holes in their centers. This is Omega Sen, and that's probably got a four. 40,000 solar mass black hole. Um, and so there's the evidence for that, I would say, is not conclusive, but still pretty strong. And of course, I suppose the, the real evidence that black holes are now incontroversial is that there have been lots of Nobel Prizes. Um, as you know, there were the three Nobel Prizes in 2017 because of the LIGO detections. Um, and then um, we, we know that the uh, well here on the right the, the Nobel Prize uh, was given shared between Penrose and and the three people who studied the evidence for black holes in the center of galaxies um, and through dynamical observations and um, and then Penrose himself got the Nobel Prize for actually basically showing that black holes should exist this is an image of M87 um and uh which which came from uh, you know observations just a year or so ago and again this is um I, no wait on they haven't got the nobel prize but at least uh this was reported at penrose symposium which is why i've, I've included it there um and, and and i mentioned ton in my previous slide and here's a little pic well sorry it's not a picture it's an artist's impression as i said that's 66 million solar masses so really, uh, it's uh, you know, but these are not in themselves primordial black holes. But I'm just trying to show you that that there is huge evidence for black holes. There is an issue though about whether LIGO is in fact a primordial black hole, and indeed whether the supermassive black holes in galaxies may be of primordial origin. And that's an issue we're going to come back to. So let me now just say a bit about what primordial black holes are. As I'm sure you know, a black hole has a radius, which is the short charge radius related to its mass, which for the sun, a stellar black hole, will be about three kilometers. And you can see from that, therefore, that a region, in order to form a black hole, to fall in its event horizon, must have a density which goes like one over the mass squared. I'm just taking the mass divided by the radius cubed. So in other words, the smaller the mass, the larger the density required. Um, if you if you're a supermassive black hole, uh, the density is very low. So you can see, for example, a billion solar mass black hole has just got the density of, of water. So a black hole formation doesn't necessarily require great density, although for a stellar mass black hole, it is it is above nuclear density. But the point is, if you have a very small black hole, the density is very large and, and, and you don't expect to form black holes less than a solar mass, at least in the present epoch. However, we know that in the early universe, I'm, I'm going to always assume that standard Big Bang picture, we know the cosmological density goes like 1 over t squared as you go back towards the Big Bang. So in theory, it, of course, diverges at the Big Bang singularity, which is t equals 0. But then you see, if I compare this density with this density, you can see that primordial black holes simply have to have a mass of order c cubed t over g well that is just the horizon mass that's to say it's the mass within the distance light can have traveled and so but that is telling you that in principle if i make t small enough i can make m also small um and and you can see immediately that primordial black holes could then have a huge range of masses for example, the um, the smallest time at which you can apply relativity theory is the Planck time, where quantum gravity comes in, and that's 10 to the minus 43 seconds, and that corresponds to a mass of about 10 to the minus 5 grams. On the other hand, if you're forming a black hole at the QCD phase transition, um, then that's at 10 to the minus 5 seconds. Um, that's the epoch at which uh, quarks turn into hadrons and protons and things like that um, which we understand quite well that corresponds to a mass of about one solar mass and we'll see later actually in these lectures that that could be particularly crucial for primordial black holes 
On the other hand, if, if the primordial black holes formed at one second, which in some sense may be the sort of maximum time, um, you would have a mass of 10 to the fifth solar masses. So you can see that primordial black holes could have a huge range of masses, all the way from 10 to the minus 5 grams to 10 to the fifth solar masses. And at the higher end, of course, these are just like the astrophysical black holes, which we know exist at the present epoch. On the other hand, these very small black holes are very different. And I've highlighted the black holes that form at 10 to the minus 23 seconds. They have a mass of 10 to the 15 grams. That's about the mass of a mountain, but it's the size is just the size of a proton, a Fermi. And we're going to see they're very important because of the Hawking evaporation. Um, and so uh, you, that's the important message. They could have a huge range of masses if they formed. Now, uh, in a way, the first paper on this topic was by Stephen Hawking. I'm going to mention some earlier work by the Russians, but the first person to seriously advocate this was Stephen Hawking um, in 1971. And, and actually, his picture was a bit different because he was interested in black holes of the Planck mass, 10 to the minus 5 grams. Um, but he thought they would have charge, electric charge, and they would therefore capture electrons or protons and form uh, atoms, if you like, neutral atoms. And, and he was interested in what the observational consequences of these would be. He thought, for example, they would be detected in bubble chambers. Um, he thought they might accumulate in the center of the, the sun, for example, and that might explain um, the, new, the solar neutrino problem, which was becoming important in 1971. Now, actually, uh, th this picture really broke was invalidated a few years later because it, when we he came to think of the quantum effects of black holes, he realized that black holes would lose their electric charge very quickly. So we don't expect primordial black holes to have charge. So this particular scenario is no longer taken very seriously. But it was a paper in 71, which was exactly, almost exactly 50 years ago, 51 years ago, where he was arguing that primordial black holes should actually form. But actually, the very first paper on the subject goes back to 1967 by Zeldovich and Novikov. Um, but actually, th their conclusion was rather negative, because what they argued was that the black holes are forming, obviously, in a very high density environment. The early universe is very dense. And they, they argued that the black hole would accrete very rapidly. And in fact, it would grow as fast as the universe so that any primordial black hole would grow to something like 10 to the 15 solar masses. And we know there can't many, be many black holes in that mass range. So actually, their, their conclusion, this is five years before Hawking, was that probably there are no primordial black holes. And in a way, that held up the um, studies of primordial black holes for five years. But when I did my PhD with Stephen Hawking, we, we realized that argument was wrong. And, and I'm going to um, give the argument, first of all, from Zeldovich and Novikov, and then the argument from myself and Stephen, because this is goes way back into the history. And actually, people probably have forgotten these arguments, but I think it's quite important. So I thought I would go over this. This is the Zeldovich Novikov argument. You assume that the black hole is accreting according to the Bondi formula. So Ra is the accretion radius. It's matter is it's going through the horizon at something like the speed of sound, Vs. Um, and the accretion radius depends upon the actual um, speed of sound. And so there's your formula for the accretion rate. Alpha is just a constant. Um, and then the you can you know what the density is in the early universe r infinity just means the background density it goes like one over t squared but it depends on k and k is the equation of state p equals k rho and the sound speed is then k to the half and then it's easy to show that the dm by dt just goes like m squared over t squared uh, where beta is a constant here and you, you can integrate this and you get this simple formula and this formula has a very simple consequence. First of all, that this mass t, beta t, is essentially the, the horizon mass. Um, and what you can see is, if the for mf is the formation mass of the black hole, if the mass is initially much smaller than the horizon, 
then you can see it doesn't grow much at all. However, if the black hole has a size comparable to horizon, then you can see from this formula that it always grows at the same rate as the horizon. So m goes like the horizon mass. And this was the source of the problem, because you do expect primordial black holes to have the horizon mass. I gave you that argument earlier on. And therefore, you in theory would predict that these black holes would grow as fast as the horizon. So even if they're very small to begin with, they're going to grow to something like, well, the horizon mass at the end of the radiation era, which is something like, well, 10 to the 15 solar masses. Um, but obviously, well, there was this wasn't a very satisfactory argument because it neglected the, the cosmological expansion. And obviously, the cosmological expansion is, is going to tend to suppress the accretion. And also, this is not a relativistic argument. It's a Newtonian argument. So myself and Stephen, we, we, uh, we wrote a paper in 74. This was my first paper where we examined this in more detail. We, we discussed why they would form in the early universe, but also we examined the accretion. And then, as I've underlined here, this motivates a more detailed study of the accretion rate, which shows that black holes will not, in fact, substantially increase their mass. Um, and so in some sense, there was that meant there was no observational energy evidence against them. Oh, here's a picture of me and Stephen and, and the secretary at that time. I, I was I had a beard in those days. But remember, this is nearly 50 years ago. So I've aged and I have to wear glasses now and, and all that. Um, my my co my co lecturer Florian is still very young. So but and but I don't think he has a beard. Now, um, I'm going to even tell you what the argument was. Um, the argument depended upon looking at spherically symmetric self-similar solution in, in relativity, because a self-similar, this is a little bit technical, but I'll give the argument anyway. You look in a self-similar metric, um, everything is a function of Z, which is R over T. So length scales, and you know, always go up with time. So as R goes up, T goes up. So there's this self-similar variable. And there's a, it's a bit technical, but the surface of the, the speed of the fluid relative to a constant Z surface is a function of Z. You've got these metric functions phi and psi, which come in at the particle horizon and the event horizon. The velocity fluid velocity defined by this is one at a sonic point. It's actually root K. Um, and what we showed is there is no this is spherically symmetric cell similar. That's the four S's solution in which a black hole interior is attached to an exact Friedman exterior by a sound wave. Because the point is, if you're forming a black hole, um, there'll be a sound wave, and you'd expect there to be an exact Fre Friedman solution outside, but a collapsing uh, region inside. And there simply isn't a self-similar solution like that. So for example, here is, the, here is the flat Friedman model. This is the velocity as a function of z. z is not the redshift, it's this parameter here. Here's the exact Friedman solution. And if you wanted a self-similar solution, it would have to look like this. So it would have to have a, um, it would have to, there, here you would have the cosmological particle horizon where V equals one, and there would be the black hole event horizon again where V equals one. Now, actually, it turns out there is a one parameter family of solutions, but they're not exactly Freeman. And the, this smooth red curve is one of that one parameter family of solutions. But it's not formed by causal processes because um, it's essentially formed because you start off the universe by throwing in lots of matter into the black hole. But if you have an exact Freeman universe, in other words, you try and attach this solution to a black hole through a sound wave to the to the to the blue solution through a sound wave, there is no solution. And what this means is that PBH is formed by local processes cannot grow much at all. Um, so I know this argument's a little bit technical, but obviously you can look up the reference if you want it more. But it, I think it really was an important result because it, it wasn't completely obvious that that would be the case. But that is why, in some sense, it made sense to think about primordial black holes. They weren't excluded. Um, now, in 1974, just a few years later, of course, Stephen Hawking uh, discovered that black holes aren't black at all, that they actually emit due to quantum particles due to quantum effects. 
Now, uh, this is the abstract of his famous paper. You don't, don't try and read it. There isn't time to read it. But, but the point is, this effect, the temperature goes like one over the mass. So it's very small for the sort of black holes we know exist. However, um, for primordial black holes, the temperature goes like one over M. So a primordial black hole or low M, it could be a high temperature. And indeed, Hawking was motivated to think about this precisely because he thought he realized primordial black holes could be around and they're the ones for which quantum effects are important so this is the nature paper and there's a little diagram which explains it all but th this result has always been regarded as uh, really amazingly important because it unifies um, quantum theory relativity theory and thermodynamics um, and so uh, this is here is Hawking of course who died three years ago. Oh my goodness, even four years ago. This is a famous, the temperature uh, is about 10 to the minus seven for a solar mass black hole, but it goes like one over the mass. So it unifies quantum mechanics, general relativity, and thermodynamics. That's Boltzmann up there. And uh, But it's interesting that even if primordial black holes that never formed, thinking about them has been really important because it was only a result of thinking of them that actually he came up with this result and it is generally accepted that this is one of the most important results i would say in 20th century physics um, it's still not been experimentally verified but it's just such a beautiful result that it's almost accepted universally it has to be true um, John Wheeler, who coined the word black holes, he once said to me in a conversation, he said, just talking about this result was like rolling candy on the tongue, <laughs> which I thought was a beautiful analogy. Um, you notice all these people are smiling, except for Boltzmann. Boltzmann's looking, and of course, Boltzmann ended up committing suicide. But I mean, uh, everybody's smiling because it, it's such a, a beautiful result, rolling candy on the tongue. Now. Um, let me do this in a bit more detail. Here's the actual formula for the temperature. It, it, it combines H, Planck's constant, the speed of light, and the uh, gravitational constant, and Boltzmann's constant. What that means is the black hole actually is going to evaporate completely, because if it's losing, if it's radiating, it's losing mass. And, and in fact, you can show the lifetime of the black hole goes like m cubed. And for a million, for a solar mass object, it's very large. It's 10 to the 64 years, so obviously we don't have to think about it. But this magic mass of 10 to the 15 grams, which I mentioned before, that has a lifetime comparable to the age of the universe, which is roughly uh, 10 to the 10th years. And those black holes will be exploding. As they, as they lose mass, they get hotter and hotter. And eventually they get so hot when they get down to about 10 to the 10th grams, they're so hot that they, their lifetime is down to a second. So they basically lose their final mass in an explosion. And so the, that raised the interesting question, well, can we detect the explosions of these primordial black holes? Remember, there it's a small mass compared to a star, but nevertheless, the mass is being completely converted into radiation. Um, and as I said, this can only be important for primordial black holes because they're the only ones that can be less than a solar mass. Well, actually, at first, it was bad news because most of their life, these black holes are sizzling away and producing a 100 MeV gamma ray background. Um, and we already knew, even in 1974, that the background density uh, of the gamma ray background uh, was less than something like 10 to the minus 9. Uh, and that's in units of the critical density required for the universe to recollapse. So that meant the density of black holes, that's denoted by omega, the, the density in units of the critical density, must be length less than 10 to the minus 8. Well, given that, you can ask, well, how many of the black holes are there locally and what is the number density? You can work out the explosion rate and uh, because these would appear as gamma ray bursts. And actually, it, it, it became clear that it was unlikely that this limit would allow you to detect black hole explosions. But that was really that was sad news, because if you detected one of these explosions, it would both it would both prove the existence of primordial black holes and prove the existence of Hawking radiation, either of which would have got Stephen a Nobel Prize. So he might have got two Nobel Prizes. But uh, unfortunately, they haven't 
detected them. But mind you, there are some people who think there are a subset of gamma ray bursts, a short period gamma ray bursts, which could be black hole explosions. So this idea isn't completely out, but, but it does involve a, a somewhat unconventional view of black hole evaporation. Um, and this is this is the reference to David Klein. David Klein now is uh, uh, he died a few years ago, but um, he was very much the pioneer of that idea. And who knows, it may be correct. I'll come back to that. We'll come back to that later. But what's interesting is that if you take a black hole which is uh, less than ten to the twenty-six grams, that's the less that's the mass of the the Earth, then that would have a temperature which was bigger than the cosmic microwave background temperature. And that's quite important because those black holes are the ones which are going to actually evaporate because they're bigger than they're, te they're hotter than the cosmic microwave background. That's what CMB stands for. Um, black holes smaller than that would not actually be evaporating, despite Hawking's formula, because they will be accreting the CMB faster than they are evaporating. So the only black holes which are actually going to be quantum are the ones which are less than. 10 to the 26 grams, the mass of the Earth, and has the size of about a centimetre. So I tend to call those the quantum black holes, because they're the ones for which in practice, walking evaporation is important, and I'll come back to that. Now, but the immediate point to make is that primordial, primordial black holes probe a huge range of scales. I mentioned they have a huge range of scales, but this also means they probe physics on a huge range of scales. For example, the, the ones of the Planck mass, they are basically going to be probing quantum gravity. Remember, when you get down to the Planck scale, space and time themselves uh, it ceases to be continuum. It's like a quantum foam. All the equations of general relativity break down and, and you have to replace relativity by some new theory of quantum gravity. And, and if there were black holes like this, you would be probing quantum gravity. And indeed, Hawking radiation is important because uh, it's not it, it, it's not a theory of quantum gravity it's as such because the background space is assumed to be ordinary uh, ordinary relativistic continuum. However, it's undoubtedly going to be a, a it's an important clue as to the nature of quantum gravity. Um, and of course, in principle, they could leave Planck mass relics if Hawking evaporation stops. It could be a probe of extra dimensions because when you get down to the Planck scale things like M theory, you have extra dimensions. So uh, these are going to be very interesting. And in principle, the dark matter could be Planck mass relics because all evaporation could stop then. The black holes small than 10 to 15 grams, I've already said that they can, they would have evaporated by now, but they could still have had an important effect in the early universe. They would affect nuclear synthesis and reionization. I can't see the next word because my picture's in the way, ironically, but um, a lot of the constraints on primordial black holes come from considering the consequences of the ones that have already evaporated. The ones which are evaporating today, they they would be an important probe of high energy physics. For example, I've, I've already talked about the cosmological gamma ray background, but there's also the uh, the galactic gamma ray background and there are the cosmic rays. Um, if, 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 I mean, of course, we know cosmic rays exist and we know these backgrounds exist, but if they are actually generated by, associated with primordial black holes, that's again going to give us information about high energy physics. But of course, it's, from the point of view of these lectures, the most interesting ones are the ones which are bigger than 10 to the 15 grams, and they're probing gravity. Uh, uh, they, they are associated with critical phenomena. Florian is going to talk about that later. They could be cold dark matter candidates, a theme I'll come back to. They would have dynamical effects and lensing effects. They could generate gravitational waves. They might even, uh, you know, be associated with, with the black holes in the centers of galaxies, the supermassive black holes. So really, primordial black holes are tremendously interesting from a point of view of physics, if, if they exist. But now let me get on to this theme of PBHs as dark matter, which of course is the part of the theme of the whole lectures. Um, well, why are people keen on that? Well, first of all, we know that black holes do exist. I showed that in my very first slide. And therefore, you're not actually invoking any new physics. Uh, of course, the early universe involves ex exotic physics, but the existence of black holes doesn't involve 
involved in your physics. Where as if you are invoking particle physics candidates, you are invoking new physics because we haven't yet detected these particles. I mean, most people probably think the dark matter is some form of elementary particle, you know, as predicted by supersymmetry or something like that. And and it, they're more particle physicists than astrophysicists. So by and large, probably more people would think that the dark matter was an elementary particle. But the trouble is that after many decades of looking, no one has found any direct evidence for this. We haven't found the particles themselves in the Hadron Collider. We, we, we haven't actually found them. People look for these particles in, in underground detectors and also by indirect annihilations in space. There is actually no definite evidence yet that the dark matter is one of these particles. And, and so when the LIGO results and detected, the first detection was, I think, 2016, and, and they found black holes which were actually rather large, 30 solar masses, which is larger than expected from stellar collapse. And now they have even larger masses with far more black hole candidates. And so this is what's really powered the interest in, in primordial black holes. Now, there is a, a con, a, a, an argument against this, and the argument against it is that it seems to require fine tuning um, to get the right collapse fraction. And I'm going to come back to that, in fact, shortly. But uh, I, I'm going to argue in tomorrow, in Thursday's lecture, that this is probably not such a, 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 a you, you can get around the fine tuning argument. Um, However, uh, from it was realized very early that if primordial black holes could exist, they could explain the dark matter. Remember that in 1970, the early 1970s, there, there wasn't actually such strong evidence for dark matter in galaxies. We knew about the dark matter in clusters um, from the Zicke arguments. We were only just beginning to get evidence for dark matter in halos. But George Chapline wrote a paper in 75. Um, well, he wrote it in 74, the same year as Hawking radiation, where he was arguing that primordial black holes would be um, good dark matter candidates, because the key thing about a black hole, of course, is it is black. And, and the ones bigger than 10 to 15 grams, at least, for which there is no Hawking radiation. Um, and I think that's probably the first paper on primordial black holes as dark matter. My 75 paper also explored that, but I think this well came out at about the same time. Another important paper was by Peter Metsaros. He was uh, he was saying that if the dark matter was, say, solar mass black holes, which oddly enough is the picture which we're going, myself and Florian are going to argue for later on, he said that this would have important implications for galaxy formation. The sort of Poisson fluctuations in the number of black holes could itself generate galaxies. And that's another theme we're going to refer to. And again, this was 74. So all these ideas, I mean, you'll find a lot of papers now talking about black holes and galaxy formation, but they very few of them cite these early papers because it's it was 50 years ago and people have forgotten. But it's a very old idea. Um, now, um, I, I, an important point is that the black holes could only be the dark matter if they're primordial. I told you there's lots of evidence for black holes, but the ones in stars and galaxies, they are they are not primordial. They come from Ordean baryons. And the reason for this is very simple. Um, we know from the success of the of the Big Bang nuclear synthesis scenario, this is BBNS, Big Bang Nuclear Synthesis, um, that can generate the observed abundances of light elements, providing the baryonic density is about 0.05. I mean, we know it more precisely, but I'll let me just say it's 0.05. Now, by comparison, the dark matter density is about 25.25. This is always in units of the critical density. And the visible density is about 0.01. That's visible stars. Um, and so that's important because it tells you you need both baryonic and non-baryonic dark matter. You need baryonic because that's much bigger than that by a factor of five. And you need baryonic because that's bigger than that by a factor of five. Of course, it's interesting that all of these are comparable, you know, within a factor of within an order of magnitude. Um, now, the baryonic material, the missing baryons are probably now thought to be the uh, 
an intergalactic medium, intergalactic gas. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, for a long time, people thought, well, maybe it's it's some what's called a macho, a massive compact halo object. Um, uh, the machos, because there are many other candidates other than black holes, you know, a match, it, they, they could be brown dwarfs and, and things like that. So macho was the, the general um, term for some, it stands for massive compact halo objects. So that was the general term um, of which black holes would be a, one possible example. But also the non-baryonic candidates were, of course, well, generally generically called the WIMPs, the weakly interacting massive particles. And as I said, there isn't really so much evidence for that now. Now, primordial black holes, in some sense, are both wimps and machos. They're wimps because they're non-baryonic, and that's because they form before uh, the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And that's the crucial point, because, because they form before nucleosynthesis, they, in a radiation-dominated universe, they're not subject to this constraint. All the black holes that form later are forming from baryons are subject to that constraint. So stellar black holes and the black holes in galactic nuclei could never provide the dark matter. Now, when I say dark matter, I'm talking about the, the dark matter problem. I mean, obviously, they are dark. Black holes are dark. They contribute to dark, the dark matter density, but they're not the dark matter. In other words, the majority of the dark matter. But PBHs, because they can be large, they also have many of the of the of the features of machos, which are really massive compact halo objects, as, and we will see that later. Um, now, I mentioned that the the key evidence, the, the key point, which has triggered interest in this, is the detection of gravitational waves, the coalescence of black holes by now the combination of LIGO and Virgo and Kagura. Kagura is the Japanese uh, experiment, and now you you got. I think almost a hundred. Oh no! I've uh, sorry. I think it's fifty candidates. These are the ones that. This is the mass. The blue. These are the blue objects. And this diagram shows you the, the black hole because it's two black holes merging into one, and they're the ones shown in blue. So they're now something like. To be honest, I've forgotten if it's fifty or a hundred. You, someone can count them up. Um, uh, but anyway, it's a huge number of these black hole candidates. I think it's about fifty. But what's interesting about these is the mass is very large. I mean, you can see most of these, the first ones were 30 solar masses, but they're all, and it goes up to above 100 solar masses. By contrast, the sort of black holes which were, which are detected electromagnetically, um, you know, by accretion, uh, for example, in binaries, they are these red dots. Um, and, and these are uh, basically all less than 20 solar masses. And then there's the, of course, there's also the neutron stars. Well, they're, they're not black holes because LIGO et al. have also detected coalescences involving neutron stars. And as you'd expect, they're down here in the one solar mass range. But the key mystery is why are these black holes so large? Um, and uh, the question is, of course, the, the mainstream view is that they're simply stellar black holes, but these are larger than the most astrophysicists originally predicted. And so that raised the question, well, maybe these black holes were actually either population three stars, in other words, the first generation which formed before galaxies, or maybe they were actually primordial. And this is a theme we'll come back to in Thursday's lectures. I mean, the mainstream, most of the LIGO people, if you go to a LIGO meeting, still they assume that these things are probably stellar collapse. You know, the black holes come from stellar collapse. But if you go to a PBH meeting, and myself and Florian spend a lot of time doing that, it's almost taken for granted that these are going to be primordial black holes. And of course, it could be some mixture, because remember, you're detecting them when they coalesce. So that it doesn't really matter when they form, whether they form in the early universe or after galaxy formation, you're, you're interested in when they coalesce. And so that's, I'm going to return to that theme. We'll return to that theme on Thursday. But the, this is an important point. You can ask what fraction of the universe collapses to black holes. Um, I call that beta at the time they form. So that's a fraction of the density when they form. And there's a simple formula if I take the ratio of the black hole PBH density to the cosmic background radiation density, at the present epoch, that's just 
omega PBH over 10 to the minus 4. 10 to the minus 4 is roughly the CBR density. But as I go back in time, the black hole density goes like R to the minus 3, where R is the cosmic scale factor, but the radiation density goes like R to the minus 4. So this ratio scales like R. R is the current value. So this ratio, this, this is bigger than 1 today. Well, if omega PBH uh, is, is running the dark matter, it's bigger to 1 today, but it becomes smaller and smaller as, as you go back into the early universe. And at a time t in the early universe, then the ratio is 10 to the minus 6, for example, at 1 second. And if I go to 10 to the minus 23 seconds, uh, for example, I, again, unfortunately, I can't see the... Uh, rest of the slide because my picture's in the way. Oh, there we are. I can turn that into a mass because remember there is a relationship between the mass of the black hole and the time. So I can write that in terms of the mass. And what you can see is that the fraction uh, is absolutely tiny. For black holes of 10 to 15 grams, it's 10 to the minus 18 times omega PBH. Um, let me put that there. Right. So, uh, and that tells you the collapse fraction must be tiny. And we can be a little bit more precise. Uh, well, let me say the fraction of the dark matter is, a, is this is beta is the collapse fraction. So the relationship between the collapse fraction of the dark matter, which I'm, we're calling FDM and beta, is given by this formula here. So F is much larger uh, than beta um, because, of course, uh, for a smaller mass, it goes like m to the minus a half. So that, that formula will come in later. But anyway, this is the... Uh, so, for example, if you want this, the dark matter to be in black holes of, about a solar mass, the collapse fraction must be about one in a billion. Now, that's why I refer to the fine-tuning problem, because the, the critics say, well, it requires incredibly fine-tuning to get... Uh, all the dark matter in primordial black holes because if beta was a little bit less than 10 to the minus 9 uh, it would be negligible if it was a little bit more you'd have too much dark matter there'll be no you know most of the universe would be in, in primordial black holes so that's a criticism and I'm going to come back to that later now um, there are of course limits on the fraction of the universe collapsing um, if they're unevaporated, then, of course, the, the most obvious limit is that we know that the, they can't provide more than the dark matter density. So omega PBH has to be less than 0.25 because that's the dark matter density, which I mentioned before. I've also mentioned that the black holes are 10 to the 15 grams. The gamma ray background tells us they have to have a density less than 10 to the minus 8, which is tiny. Now, if they evaporated in the past, we, we can't see them, they've evaporated, but there are all sorts of indirect constraints. They would generate entropy, a gamma ray background, they would affect Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And for example, this is a, um, this is a constraint diagram, which I, I, I had in a paper in 1994. Um, that there is beta, the collapse fraction, a bit hard to read, as a function of the mass. But see, it goes all the way up to 10 to the 40. So these are that's about a million solar masses. And, and the shaded regions are all excluded. So that's the density limit, omega less than 0.25. This is the gamma ray background limit, 10 to the minus 8. The, the nucleosynthesis limit, deuterium and helium is there. There is the entropy limit. If, if, prime, if black holes, primordial black holes, stop evaporating at the Planck mass, you get Planck mass relics, and then you get interesting constraints given by this shaded region. But the key point is that beta is small over a wide range of, of masses. And this was way back in 94, so this was a long time ago. Um, however, the, in principle, there are lots of ranges in which the black holes, you know, could have a, a, a important density. And this is a slide I got from Profumo, who works on primordial black holes, it just introduces some interesting terminology. Here are the masses going from 10 to the minus 3 all the way up to 10 to the, uh, I can't see it, 10 to the 22 gra uh, grams, I think. Um, and he, he uses various uh, interesting terms here. The big ones are called, these are the asteroid mass black holes, which we're going to argue are actually interesting. He calls these pyramid 
black holes because they're evanescent in the sense that they are evaporating, but they haven't completely evaporated. These smaller ones would have evaporated unless there was some extra physical effect stopping the evaporation. These are called space cows. They've got about the mass of a ton. And then the, these are called grain of salt black holes, no seums. I'm not responsible for this. Uh, these are rather fancy terms. But it's just illustrating the fact that primordial black holes can cover a huge range of masses. And in principle, the ones in this mass range could still be important dark matter candidates. Um, now, somewhat more exotically, um, I mentioned the fact that when you get down to small masses, uh, that you could have extra dimensions. This is a feature of M theory, for example. I'm not going to say so much about that, but in most of the theories, in M theory, these extra dimensions, remember, you've got your three dimensions of space, your one dimension of time, which are extended. And then in M theory, you have compactified dimensions, which are compactified on, well, on the Planck scale or the string scale, which is a bit bigger. And so you might have X, X, N extra dimensions. Now, in the standard model, um, you can ask, what is the mass scale at which you get um, the effects of quantum gravity effects coming in in the standard model there is a the, the mass scale is simply the Planck mass so uh, if, if all the compactification scales are the Planck scale then nothing happens interesting until you get down to the Planck mass if however some of the dimensions are large if you have large extra dimensions then the Planck mass turns out the the, the effective Planck mass in other words the mass at which quantum gravity comes in, turns out to be much, much less than the Planck mass. Um, and, and that is Vn is, is simply the volume on which you have to get down to before the quantum gravity effects come in. Um, and, and that means that, you know, you don't have to, the Planck mass is enormous, 10 to the 19 GeV, so you can never just probe that in the Large Hadron Collider. But in principle, if you have extra, large extra dimensions, quantum gravity effects could come in way, way below the Planck mass, and even at the, the, the scale which could be probed by the Large Hadron Collider. Um, so, uh, that, as I say, the, this is the MD is the d-dimensional Planck mass. Uh, now, what this means is that actually, you can, uh, what if you have large extra dimensions? It means that inside that dimension, gravity no longer goes like one over r squared; it, it increases faster. And that means that you can actually form black holes in the in the Large Hadron Collider, you, because of, because of gravity gets stronger, um, and that is what's sometimes called TV quantum gravity. Quantum gravity effects coming in at a TV scale rather than ten to the nineteen GeV. But why that's important is because it means that you can actually f form black holes at TeV energies. And of course, there was a lot of interest in that. Now, um, I have to say that people look for this in the large house. Well, incidentally, what it means is, for example, the Schwarzschild radius, when you get below that, that critical mass, um, uh, it, instead of going like m, it goes like m to the 1 over 1 plus n. The temperature is still roughly the same, but it, well, it goes like 1 over rs. And the lifetime, instead of going like m cubed, goes like, it depends on the number of uh, large remember n is the number of large extra dimensions so the lifetime becomes much larger the temperature becomes much smaller and so uh, the fact of the matter is that at the moment there is no evidence for this uh, in, in the Large Hadron Collider in other words it hasn't generated the black holes I mean people are interested in that because if you did generate the black holes um, they would evaporate immediately by Hawking effect and you know the, the it would, it would be like a Christmas tree in the Large Hadron Collider. Now, we haven't detected this, but it doesn't actually exclude higher dimensions. It just excludes higher dimensions on a certain uh, on a certain energy scale. All we can say is that you don't have TeV quantum gravity. You, you could still have 100 TeV quantum gravity, for example. Uh, and this, these are, this is a picture from the, you know, the uh, Large Hadron Collider, but it would have been tremendously exciting if they were to detect them because you'd have a way of probing the extra dimensions directly. It would be very, very exciting. But as I say, there isn't currently any evidence for this, so I'm not going to focus on that too much at the moment. 
but I did I did mention how PBHs would be a probe of of, of these extra dimensions. Of course, these aren't directly primordial black holes. These are being formed in, in, in an accelerator. But if this picture were correct, it would have implications for the formation of black holes in the early universe. Now, there is also a certain sense in which the universe is a primordial black hole. The whole universe is a primordial black hole. This arises in various different contexts. Smolin, for example, argues that if the black, if a black hole forms, Remember, it forms the singularity, but we don't know what happens at the singularity. It would then generate a, a baby universe. And then that baby universe might itself generate black holes, which will generate further baby universes. So he's got this picture in which, you know, black holes are basically re reproducing universes. And that would mean that our universe itself was formed from the collapse of a previous of a black hole in the previous universe. Um, but there's a more formal uh, model, which is less uh, controversial, I would say, less speculative. Uh, in in brain cosmology, I, well, it's a, that's um, one particular version of M theory. Our universe is a four dimensional brain, B R A N E, in a five dimensional bulk. So you have one extended dimension. Now that's that's the ordinary. Um, Randall Sundon picture, but in brain cosmology, you, you assume that the brain moves through the fifth dimension. Uh, and that solution is described by the five dimensional Schwarzschild and Sitter model. And what that means is that in, in this model, uh, the universe is literally emerging out of a 5D black hole because at early stages, the brain is within its, the Schwarzschild radius. The fifth dimension is corresponding to the, to the, the R coordinate in the normal Schwarzschild solution. Now, Brain co not everyone believes in brain cosmology, and it's, I suppose, less out of in vogue now. But, but nevertheless, this is a picture in which the universe emerges from a black hole, but it's, this time it's a five-dimensional black hole. Now, I want to put all this together. This is my fa favorite picture in physics. It's the cosmic Euroborus. Uh, I think you're probably familiar with this, but around the, the body of, this is the snake swallowing its own tail, and the scale, the body of the scale is a rule which tells you the scale. So you go all the way from the roughly the Planck scale uh, at the top left. As you go to the uh, in an anti-clockwise direction, the scale increases by a power of 10 for each minute, if you like. And then you go all the way up to the scale of the universe, which is at roughly 10 to the plus 30. So it's 60 scales, so 60 decays of scale. So it's a little bit like a... A clock and so uh, right down in the middle at the bottom are human beings and, and as you go to the right you've got mountains and planets and stars and solar systems and galaxies and then the universe uh, larger and larger the, and then as you go to the left you get increasingly small scales ants amoebas dna atoms nuclei and all the subatomic particles and you've got the uh, m theory you know the planck scale at the top left and and not only that, but the the various forces of nature link the the microscopic domain on the left and the macroscopic domain on the right. Um, it's linked, for example, the, the same electric force which holds the electron in orbit around the proton is is what determines the structures of solid objects like the Earth. The same electric and strong forces, sorry, the same weak and strong forces which operate inside a nucleus is what powers the sun. The same gut force, grand unified theory force, which which you associate it with dark matter models, is is what may be providing you know the dark matter, and, and indeed the density the density fluctuations which make galaxies. So this is my favourite diagram because it, it it depicts the the triumph of physics. However, and and also in in understanding all the different levels of structure in the universe and, and the different interactions which link the micro and the macro scale. However, um, I want to apply this diagram in the context of black holes. So there's microphysics on the left and macrophysics on the right. And, um, and the Big Bang, incidentally, is where the head meets the tail. I, I won't go into that. I mean, basically, when you look to larger distances, you're looking back in time. So when you look back to the horizon size, the universe was very small. So there's a natural link between 
the very large and the very small. But anyway, let's now apply this diagram to black holes. This is a length scale, so I'm going to put the various black holes um, around this diagram using the short charge radius as the criteria. So there are the stellar black holes of about a solar mass. There are the uh, 100 solar mass black holes, the intermediate mass black holes. Million, there's a million solar mass black hole in our galaxy, the Milky Way, it's 4 million actually. A billion solar mass black hole in quasars. And then as I, I said, even in some sense, the universe might be a black hole, 10 to the 22 solar masses. But then there are the terrestrial black hole, a black hole with the mass of the Earth will be 10 to the 25 grams. A lunar black hole would be a mass of 10 to the 21 grams. These could, in principle, be dark matter candidates. Uh, the evaporating black holes are 10 to the 15 grams. Remember, I'm taking the size here as the criteria. So remember, the size of that is about the size of a proton. Um, uh, an exploding black hole, uh, about 10 to the 10th grams. And then the Planck mass black hole uh, is, is, is at the top left. And what's interesting also about this diagram is that you can have down at the bottom, remember the quantum black holes are the ones which were smaller than the mass of the Earth. So this is the, uh, the quantum classical division. And up at the top, this is where you have the, the effects of higher dimensions coming in. So there's a nice symmetry here uh, between the micro and the macro. And of course, quantum evaporation is, is a, providing a sort of another link between the micro and the macro uh, domains. So this is, uh, I love this diagram because it, it, it basically is based on the cosmic Ouroboros, which is my favorite diagram in physics, but it's putting black holes in the picture and they're my favorite objects in physics. So to me, this, this is heaven, this picture. Now, um, and of course, uh, it, the, the Big Bang is, you know, the, it links the very large with the very small. And so the primordial black holes are sort of forming, of course, in the early universe. So this is just a little depiction of that. Um, now, um, so let me summarize this in this diagram. This is, uh, I mean, the point I should I should stress is that the all of these black holes on the right exist, but the, bla the black holes on the left only exist if you've got primordial black holes. Because only primordial black holes, in fact, prim in, pra in principle, primordial black holes can go all the way up. To the whole universe could be a primordial black hole. So primordial black holes could occupy the entire circle. Um, but only primordial black holes could occupy the left side. And that's depicted in this diagram here. Um, this is the, the cosmic Ouroboros. There are the, the stellar black, S is stellar black holes between 50 and 50. Five and fifty solar masses. Here are the supermassive black holes between ten to the six and ten to the tenth solar masses. But everything else um, in orange would be primordial. And so you have to ask the question: Are most black holes primordial? And if you're going to argue that the black holes are the dark matter, of course they have to be. Most of the black holes are primordial because they provide most of the density. Um, and I have to say, you know, I'm obsessed with black holes. I spent my life st studying them. You've got to realize that most most astrophysicists only study a particular type of black hole. So there are stellar black hole people, astrophysicists, and they're supermassive black hole people, and they're normally distinct. Um, but I, I think to understand the real significance of black holes, you have to see them in the full context. And that's why this diagram I find so exciting. Now, we still don't know for sure, even after Florin and myself and delivered the lectures, we're not going to convince you 100% that primordial black holes exist. But it's clear that they could exist. And, and, and God will be very cruel if, if he didn't allow primordial black holes to exist. Well, you may not believe in God, but I mean, I, I think you should believe in primordial black holes probably. Um, so um, now at that point, I, I, that's the end of my lecture. I've, I've overshot by five minutes. Um, I don't know. I, I am not going to talk, so um, I'm not exhausted. Florian may be exhausted because he had to listen to me. The question is whether you, as the audience, want a five minute break. Um, and I would ask the chair to comment on this. Do we want a five minute break or does Florian, should Florian jump straight in? Uh, I think it's fine. 
fine to go straight on. Yeah, go straight on. Okay. So the audience, it all depends on the audience, whether they, they're, mm. they're, they're exhausted. You think it's fine? Okay, I'm, I'm, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, I'm completely impartial because I, I'm, I'm going to relax now. So, uh, Florian, are you happy to go straight in or are you too exhausted having listened to me? No, no, no. It's always a pleasure to, um, to, to listen to you and particularly about this, this absolutely fascinating uh, subject, which then, you know, provides a stage for what I'm going to uh, talk. So I'm, I'm um, anything but exhausted. I'm really excited. Um, Wonderful, so, well, I, and of course yeah. I can reciprocate. <laughs> I'm excited at looking forward uh, to your talk. So what I'm going to do, though, I'm mm. going to stop sharing, and um, I will. You'll see me again tomorrow. You'll see my little picture during Florian's talk. But I will talk again on Thursday. Um, but I, I'm going to stop sharing now. And anyway, it's been nice to meet everybody. In theory, I can't see the pictures of people, but anyway, I hope you're all there. And I'm going to stop sharing now, and uh, it's now for for Florian to uh, introduce yes. his uh, slides. So, hello. Um, I wanted to say good morning, but for you it's good evening, probably. <laughs> um, so um, I am now going to continue with the second part of the Tuesday lecture, which is on formation. So let me just. Um, start the slideshow. So let's see how that goes. Can you see my screen? Hello, I, I can't. Can see can't... You, you can see my screen. Okay, there yep. was some the sound disturbance. Yep. Can, can you see my pointer also? Yep. Very good. Very good. So now, all right, so Bernard gave this very nice introduction to, to the subject. And of course, we now want to go a little bit deeper and one of the most fundamental things that we need to understand about primordial black holes is how they form and of course you can imagine since the first paper appeared on primordial black holes decades ago many formation mechanisms have been developed so i can't possibly tell you about all of these I will mention the most important ones, to my opinion, the most discussed ones. Um, but regardless of the formation mechanism, all of those have in common the generation of a large enough overdensity that then collapses into a black hole. So basically, we all we, we stay uh, in the realm of um, general relativity, and where we need a large enough energy density. So, and of course, the, the, the first one is probably the most discussed one, the ones where most papers have been written on. It's the generation of large density perturbation, mostly of inflationary origin. I will talk much more about primordial black holes and inflation with much uh, more details. But I can already tell you that it's this is very similar to what we know from the cosmic microwave background, when we have these fluctuations that are um, set by, by inflation. But here we have two things different, a different amplitude. We will see we need a much larger amplitude such that the region is actually collapsing, not just having um, sort of density fluctuation that probably leads to some structure formation, but um, it's, it's, we need something much larger. And the scales will turn out to be much smaller. We will see by how much smaller later on. Then actually this pressure reduction is not meant to be really a separate mechanism, but something that is more, say, an assisting mechanism to also, in particular, the, the one I mentioned before. Can imagine when you are in a, in a universe say, in radiation domination, which is probably the most relevant epoch for primordial black hole formation, that you have, besides the gravitational attraction, you have the um, radiation pressure. And the radiation pressure works against the collapse so when you have an event um, or a sequence of events that reduce the pressure, like you have in the phase transition, the most prominent one being the, the QCD transition, and we will talk in this lecture and also in the, in the next lecture about some exciting aspects of the QCD phase transition, then you know you will reduce the pressure. Now, if you reduce the pressure by a bit, that would help a lot to, pro to um, um, enhance the um, 
the formation of, of primordial black holes. We will talk later more about this. Then more exotic uh, scenarios involve cosmic strings, so one-dimensional topological defects that could self-intersect and then form closed string loops, and where, which may lead to a large enough energy density that then um, leads to the formation of black holes. Also, um, you know, related to say phase transitions, when you have first order phase transitions, which lead to the nucleation of bubbles, or certain circumstances, the bubbles um, may collide, and you could also have large enough energy densities in order to form black holes. I have to say that these scenarios usually require some degree of tuning. Um, we will talk later more about this. So this is meant to be this first slide uh, on the formation to be an overview. And then a more recent scenario even involves um, a connection to quantum chromodynamics where you have quarks that are pushed out of the horizon um, by, by inflation and then sort of re-enter again. And then there's a big flux tube forming and this massive amount of energy leads to the formation of black holes. So you see there's um, a large spectrum, but the first mechanism is probably um, the one that is, that is has been most discussed and what probably um, most of the time will be devoted to. Now let's let's go here. So okay, this comes back um, to an old paper from the mid 1970s, written by, um, by, by by Bernard Carr. It's it's a it's a really uh, it's a simple but brilliant um, calculation. It's a nice consideration where it was assumed that one has um, a perfect fluid. So in, in here, the perfect fluid is uh, as equation of state with P equal or P is pr the pressure is proportional to the density. So P is proportional to the rho. Um, but nowadays, I think the notation is a little bit different. Instead of alpha, what was called alpha in, in the early days, now people usually like to write W. Um, um, but uh, but regardless of how you call this constant, um, what what, um, what Bernard Carr found um, was by considering a top hat over density and comparing the scale of the over density to its gene slangs, that basically the over density, so delta, so meaning delta rho over rho, so the over density above which you trigger collapse, that is related to the equation of state parameter, it's alpha. So in radiation domination, it would be a third. Now, it, I, will, uh, I will show you a slide um, and, and mention results where you know, that get a little bit changed, but actually not by much. And it will always be related to the equation of state parameter in, in this class of, of scenarios. So that was actually a, a very nice insight that, that Bernard Carr got at, at this time. Now, so if you have Gaussian fluctuations, um, Gaussian fluctuation spectrum um, with a root mean square um, amplitude like epsilon, say, and then you can relate this amplitude or this, 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 um, this uh, parameter epsilon to the fraction of collapsed horizon patches um, in, in this way. So it's an exponential dependence. And you can already see uh, in this formula that alpha is very crucial. So if you change alpha by a bit, and that links to this pressure reduction, which I, meant, uh, which I mentioned before, that if you change the pressure by a bit, um, you would drastically change the amount of patches that then collapse to black holes. And we will see later on how this comes really about, but this already give, gives you a link. So this is, here's a picture of, in the probability distribution, it's, it's here's a Gaussian, it's assumed, um, um, showing the probability to, to generate a certain density contrast, delta, and above a certain critical threshold, del say delta C, to be called delta C, you would form black holes. Now, this threshold is dependent on various factors like the shape of the overdensity and, and the environment. So it depends on various uh, factors. Now, and it's a bit exaggerated uh, in here. Um, so usually you are far more out in the table. We're talking about something like 10 or 15 sigma fluctuations. <clears throat> so you would be, um, um, you know, it, it's, it's a bit further up in the tail, but, but the, the picture holds. And moreover, the, the, the very tail is probably not Gaussian. It, it, it looks like 
um, by latest calculation, it, it seems to be exponential, but nevertheless, it's very well, it's very suppressed. Now, and of course, if epsilon is constant, you can calculate the mass spectrum um, very easily, and you, you get the following result, but also, of course, depends on the equation of state parameter. This diagram is probably the first diagram on constraints on the collapse fraction beta as a function of mass. So it's in a paper from Bernard Carr, uh, Gilbert and, and Litzy from um, 1994, which I think has been shown in the introduction. And here um, it, we will see more updated work, many uh, updated version of this, which, which underwent certain evolution and have many more um, details in them. But, but so here, the, here actually the most basic sort of the most basic um, constraint is given by not overproducing primordial black holes, not having more primordial black holes than you have dark matter. And by the formula I showed before, you can actually relate this to the amplitude epsilon, the, the, the variance epsilon, if you like, also as a function of, of mass. And you, you see, I mean, at this time, um, you know, there was no WMAP or Planck results out, so you have results from, from Kobe. Now you probably say um, there's some, uh, results from Planck, but you, you see that this amplitude basically um, here um, has been, you know, set to uh, or has been measured on this pivot scale at a rather low um, low level, at much lower than, than, than sort of um, you would need to produce an order one fraction of the dark matter in terms of primordial black holes. And also the scales you see are vastly different. But this is also something which you can regard as a, as a virtue because, you know, we have access with this um, cosmic microwave uh, background experiments with large scale structure on a range of scales. But this range of scales is very, very different from the range of scales primordial black holes probe. So in a sense, primordial black holes are a unique probe on epsilon on, on these very small scales. But of course, you also see, since you need these large amplitudes, that somehow you need to um, go there. And, and there, there's this number of ways. But so either you need a blue spectrum, so one that increases at small um, at smaller scales, or you need a feature. But of course, when you have a blue spectrum, you somehow need to cut it off because you can't, can't just grow. And actually, some inflation, and not, not, not but some, really several inflationary models have been have been disregarded by the fact that the, um, the, the, the they overproduce primordial black holes. So you can also um, use these constraints, uh, these, these, these considerations by um, sort of <clears throat> constraining inflationary scenarios. Now, this is again, a similar picture to, a picture, um, 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 to the, the one I showed before, showing this spectral feature. This is here we have the primordial a power spectrum of curvature fluctuations. Um, and here we have this as a function of, of time measured in number of e-folds. Here we have something which is almost scale invariant, but actually the tilt goes in the wrong direction. Um, so, and you, you have the CMB scales probing roughly the last uh, or 10 e-folds or so, but primordial black hole scales probe way, way earlier scales. And, and you can see it, that you need some sort of feature and of course, there's different ways, and we'll talk about how to generate precisely um, these features and, and, and which masses this corresponds to. But you can also see that um, basically it, it's not inconsistent um, with these tiny fluctuations we measure in the cosmic microwave background to have very large fluctuations for primordial black holes because the scales are very much apart. And this is what, what a message I, I like to convey the, these, these scales accessible through cosmic microwave background experiments and um, primordial black holes are very far apart. Now, now to the, to the threshold. Like I said, the, the first calculation uh, by Bernard Carr in the 1970s uh, was, well, pointing in, in really in, in, in the right direction, giving the right connection um, to the right quantity so that the, the threshold, the delta C is linked to the equation of state parameter. If it's radiation, basically you need to be bigger than a third with your fluctuations with the delta, that meaning delta rho over rho. 
Later studies confirmed this, but the primary backwards were um, seem to be a little bit smaller than the horizon. Um, but you know, then over time, uh, you know, there were more calculations and more numerical simulation um, been done, and a rather high value has been has been um, um, put out. But actually, later calculations um, showed that this this value not so far from from the original value that Bernard Carr found um, in the 1970s seemed to be really a, a nowadays accepted value and and this is really confirmed by by latest work although I must say this is depending on, on the shape so if it's if it's not spherical if it's a soil it is different if it's um if you have sort of some people study a Mexican head shape over density and so forth. So it's, it depends a little bit on, on the shape and of course on the environment. We will come back to that. But coming back to what um, um, I mentioned with this um, latest uh, numerical results, they also assume this what's called critical collapse. What is this? Critical collapse is a property of a collapse in general relativity. Now general relativity has, um, when, when you have this large overdensity and you you it is sufficiently large to to collapse on its own gravitational effect, then it's not that basically what several people assumed that you could just take all the mass for the primordial black hole, which is you know contained in a horizon or or, or um, say a fraction of seventy percent or so a fixed fraction of of, of this mass. Um, into the black hole, and, and that's it. You get you, do, you won't get a monochromatic mass spectrum, but actually, what you get out is a mass spectrum um, that has the function dependence. It depends on the density contrast, and it goes more like like this. Has been found in the 1990s by Matthew Choptek and by the randomization group arguments, and then has been later um, refined by by several groups by by by. Um, um, Yedamsik, for instance, and Niemeyer, and also uh, Moskomen and Monarev, and, and others as well. So, and they did numerical simulations. So here you see, in this graph, you see the numerical results. So they looked for radiation domination of a perfect fluid and an overdensity, which is a Mexican hat shaped profile. And here you see their results. And this is interesting. So you, here you have the mass of the black hole over the horizon mass. On this axis and in a logarithmic representation, here you have the delta, so the density contrast minus the critical uh, value, again um, in, in, inside a logarithm. And, and what you find, look at this, this over 10 hours of magnitude, you see the scaling now confirmed. And this is using fully nonlinear, state of the art um, general relativity code. So this is really there. So this is just an abstract uh, academic um, um, uh, play of thoughts. Um, actually not, it's, this is something which tells you that basically strictly, you cannot get a monochromatic mass function, which would be a bit um, difficult to get anyways, because if you, you need um, a feature which sort of comes in a sort of a delta function spike, um, but if, even if you had this and here for the sake, uh, as, as, as if you put all the dark matter in terms of, um, 30 solar mass black holes, or at, at, this, at least in re entering at, at, at the horizon with this mass. And this, this, this diagram shows the dark matter fraction versus the mass. And here, this is the result, the would be result from the horizon mass approximation. Um, and when you assume critical collapse, you see that this is actually lowered, shifted, and um, broadened. So, this is um, um, so telling you that basically. It's not possible to get a monochromatic mass function. It's already something which is not so realistic at the beginning because when you say you produce primordial black holes from inflation, then you have a feature in the in inflationary potential, say a plateau, and that is also not um, usually not um, limited to to a certain scale, but it, it sort of it comes with an extended. Um, um, range of scales, and this you have to then to convolute with these critical collapse mass functions. So it's basically not possible to get strictly monochromatic spectrum. You may, may come close to this, but strictly you would have something which is made out. Now, primordial black holes, 
and inflation. And <laughs> it's sort of amusing to, to think about that what inflation does, first and foremost, <laughs> it, get it gets rid of any abundance of primordial black holes that, are, uh, that existed before its end. So if you have um, any, uh, like with monopoles, and, and like any abundance of primordial black holes, significantly before existing significantly before the end of inflation um, these would get inflated away and exponentially diluted but this actually could be used to look for sort of minimum mass because you can imagine that the mass even though you have a spectrum but but um, you roughly at the peak of the spectrum is roughly the, the i mean the spectrum i mean the mass spectrum of primordial black holes is roughly um, a, a close to the horizon mass. And, and this horizon mass depends on, on the time or the temperature of the universe. And then depending on how the reheat temperature is, you get different results for the minimum possible mass of primordial black holes produced in this inflationary way. And since we have an upper bound on the reheat temperature from uh, CMB quadrupole measurements, basically um, you have find that the minimum possible mass uh, which you could get in this way is, is about a gram. So inflationary primordial black holes should be basically heavier than about one gram. Now what inflation does, now, um, since I told you about how it's getting rid of abundance and what the minimum mass, but it actually does uh, generate fluctuations. And these fluctuations are linked to specific form of the inflationary potential. And here we have a um, simple case of a single field inflationary scenario uh, with uh, you know, inflation potential V of phi um, and phi being the inflaton, which is sort of rolling down the potential and thereby you get fluctuations. But what you notice is that the delta rho over rho, so the density contrast which you generate uh, is basically uh, related to also one over the derivative of the potential. And here you already see that when the potential is very flat, these fluctuations become very large. And I mentioned plateau briefly at the beginning. And this is already, this is something which, which of course helps you a lot in, in producing these very large density fluctuation. And the question is, is this enough to generate primordial black holes? Now, here's a picture of the evolution of, of the universe and the different epochs. I put scale on this axis versus time and number of e-folds. And here we have the Hubble scale in gray. So we have inflationary period, period of reheating. I put it a bit extended because it's not so clear um, how this exactly um, behaved. Um, you could even have a sequence of meta domination here, but I don't want to complicate issues. So that's uh, some phase of reheating, radiation, matter, and then something that appears to be like a cosmic cosmological constant. Now, a physical scale is redshifted outside of the horizon during inflation. It's exponentially pushed out, and at some point when inflation is over and the um, expansion slowed down, it came ba back again into causal contact at some point, say during radiation domination for sake of simplicity. And if the density contrast at this scale, at this time, exceeds the critical threshold, a collapse to a black hole is triggered in, in that horizon patch. And something which is trivial, but I nevertheless wanted to mention that scales that re-enter later, and later entering mean entering, re-entering in a bigger, um, horizon patch, therefore a more uh, leaning to a more massive black hole, so a more massive black hole um, actually um, originated earlier. So bigger black holes correspond to earlier times. Okay. Now, and again, one of the first works uh, is uh, has been done by by Bernard Carr, who calculated uh, the, the spectrum of these, these fluctuations and uh, were concerned with primordial black hole formation in this inflationary context. Um, so uh, Bernard Carr and Andrew Mitzi, it's in 1993 already. And so it, they considered a slow roll um, setup. So um, the slow roll parameters uh, C and, and eta are very small. And you can then calculate the spectrum of fluctuations. And, but then you see also that if you compare what, what, what you would need and what you, what you have, you know, if you compare 
to cosmic microwave background um, fluctuation because the cosmic microwave background originates from, from inflation, uh, then you, you see that these, it's a bit what, what, I, what I said before, that the amplitude and these CMB scales need to be very much enhanced at these small scales uh, which um, um, uh, primordial, on which primordial black holes form. So one option is to have sort of a blue spectrum. So you increase, so, yeah? But that, that sort of is not an option because you um, observe that precisely the wrong sign is, has been found um, by CMB experiments. You can try a running, you can say, aha, the spectral index sort of evolves with time, but Planck uh, gives actually the wrong sign. So you, you can't, I mean, you cannot really then have, uh, at least directly from there, this, this growing. You could have a running of the running and you could sort of tailor expand and have other um, functional dependencies later on. But basically you need some, some sort of a spectral um, feature in change the inflationary potential. If, it, if it's this um, inflationary context and single field inflation and at the spectral, you have a, um, you need um, um, a feature in the um, inflationary potential, a V. So, and then in, at a particular scale, say when you have a plateau or inflection point, um, you can um, produce enough density fluctuations or large enough density fluctuations that generate um, primordial black holes. Now, but you know, this is really when it started, but then once it broke loose, basically, uh, they, you know, you have so many scenarios. I think in one talk, I remember Bernard Kahn had a slide uh, of all the inflationary scenarios um, involving, say, hybrid inflation, multi-field inflation, running index inflation, designer inflation, preheating, axiom curvature inflation, and, and so on and so forth. So you have a lot of these inflationary uh, scenarios that could, in principle, produce primordial black holes or are, could be constrained by sort of overproducing primordial black holes. But again. It's very easy to have basically no primordial black hole. And it's very easy to have too many of them. The art is to get enough. And, and there are some natural scenarios and we will talk about one particular in the second lecture on Thursday, which gives you sort of the right amount of primordial black holes in a very natural way. But given the plethora of these, all these inflationary um, scenarios, are, are, we, are we sort of lost in, 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 in this sort of zoo? Well, actually, they're not really lost. At least we have some 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 helper, and this helper is, uh, or the the uh, some something that 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 provides some 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 sort of classification or unification in, in some sense, at least approximately, um, is a sort of local normal mass function. And here I put the um, the f by the m, so dark matter fraction um, as a derivative with respect to the mass, um, as a function of of the mass and units of solar mass for two particular models, the axion curvaton model and the running mass model. And they're in, in respectively in, in colors like red and, and, um, and blue. And the, this is the log normal mass function. And both of these models could be um, very well approximated by log normal um, mass function, depending on the these two parameters, has a, it has a um, location of the peak MF and has, has a width. It's much simpler. You, you see, it's not, perfect because this is of course symmetric and if it's model is a little bit asymmetric you can't can't get this but you you come very close and you can use this in order to sort of classify um, con or go through constraints on primordial black holes for extended mass function which which require sort of um, an integrated analysis one thing which is related to what i mentioned before several times namely the plateau and an enhancement so when you have a single field inflation uh, scenario. Basically, the, the equation that implies in Platon V is the uh, inflation potential. Basically, the equation of state is a V double prime. So, prime means derivative with respect to number of E folds um, plus three phi prime equal to derivative of the potential over H square, which is Hubble constant, equal to zero. So, that is the um, equation of state. Now, if the potential is flat, this term drops out. So, basically, the equation of motion you're left with. Um, I'm going through this because it's, it's very mathematically very simple and you can see it directly. Um, so you get pi double prime plus three phi prime equal to zero, which of course has an exponential solution. So that already tells you classically how the field um, 
evolves exponentially. And of course, by this, the uh, primordial power spectrum. But of course, this is not the whole story. There's quantum effects, strong quantum effects coming into play and they need to be treated. There are several techniques, techniques by so-called stochastic inflation. There's a whole machinery of stochastic um, differential equation which can be applied. And this, it's possible to do so. There's, there's numerous works by this. And if, if you then look what the enhancement would look like with all these sort of sometimes called quantum diffusions, with sort of the crossing quantum effects uh, in, uh, in this plateau, you see that the, the dark matter, the, the fraction of collapse to rise in patches, so beta, um, without this effect would just uh, would have, say, a certain, certain, certain peak during the plateau. But with all these effects included, you get a massive increase. So these sort of these quantum diffusion effects lead to very, very strong enhancement of the production of um, primordial black holes. Now, we talked a lot about inflation scenarios, but let me briefly at least go through a number of other scenarios, alternative scenarios that could lead to formation of primordial black holes as well. And of course, you know, nature doesn't need to be so uh, simple or so, so kind in a sense, you know, to provide it with just one scenario, you could have a mixture of scenarios as well. Um, but one scenario is if you have first order phase transition, you have only a crucial quantity here is the bubble formation rate, Hubble volume. Now, here's the trick. The point is that if you have too large enough, uh, or if, if the rate is, is uh, too large, so then you basically um, instantly fill the universe with a new vacuum and you don't have any coll um, colliding bubbles. So you don't have um, any um, um, formation of primordial black holes. If the formation rate, the bubble formation rate is too small, the bubbles would basically never see each other and don't collide, and you don't get primordial black holes either. But if you manage to get the right uh, you know, rate and you manage to have primordial black holes formed in this way, let me just briefly give you a few answers which are relevant, say around the gut epoch, that would lead to 10 to 3 gram black holes if you are at the left week. You get um, 10 to 28 grams, and at the QCD you will get around the solar mass. But of course, now we understand, or at least now it's more consensus that the QCD phase transition is a smoother transition. It's not a first order transition, as a second order transition, or what's called a crossover. And if so, then it's much less violent. You don't form these, these bubbles. Um, what, but what you get, you have an the effect is change, the pressure change um, the, the sound speed. The sound speed at 10 to minus five seconds after the Big Bang uh, dips roughly 10%. So here is a dip, it's a little bit small, I apologize. Um, here's, here's a few quantities. So it's sound speed, CS squared, and W, which was called alpha, we called alpha before. So that is um, dipping around the solar mass, a little bit more, but it's dipping around um, and then um, going after sort of um, a little bit, um, some sort of this pion plateau, um, going again back to uh, a third, which is just radiation domination. And, and like I said, by this exponential dependence between the critical threshold and the equation of state parameter and the sound speed directly will um, change the uh, critical um, threshold, this delta C, the critical overdensity above which you form black holes, um, you would get enormously more primordial black holes. And this is just a scale invariant spectrum from a paper by Burns et al. Um, here's a dark, um, dark matter fraction um, F uh, in primordial black holes, a primordial black hole dark matter fraction. And here you have the mass in terms of units of solar mass. And you see that this 10% dip um, leads to several orders of magnitude increased dark matter fraction in, in terms of black holes. So you boost it significantly. And as I already advertised, and I will, uh, I'm not, uh, won't get tired to advertise um, the, the, a very natural model that we will be going to present in the in the second part. So please uh, stay, stay tuned till um, oh, uh, again, or tune in again in, uh, at uh, 
at a Thursday, because then you will see some natural model that resolves a lot of cosmic conundra. But I don't want to uh, talk too much about this now, but I'm just saying that this plays a crucial role in understanding um, natural enhancement of primordial black holes. All right. Um, OK, so besides radiation domination, um, you could also have formation of primordial black holes in meta domination. Now we can say, aha, in meta domination, I don't have any pressure, but pressure is zero uh, there, and therefore it's, it's very easy. But then actually it turns out the collapse is prevented by deviation of spherical symmetry. So it's, it's suppressed, but it's not, uh, not as suppressed, not exponentially suppressed. It's, it's uh, of course, it's much um, comparatively much, much larger um, than in the radiation um, case. Uh, you could have this, uh, this happening, for instance, when say, after inflation and you have the inflaton decaying to a heavy particle. And this heavy particle is around for some time. They, of course, at BBN, you need, to, you need to be done with this, but I mean, at latest, um, but before you could have sort of a meta-dominated phase and then this heavy particle decays again later into some other particle, the second Oh, Brian. I don't. Basically, I don't hear anything. Oh, okay. Hello. Ah, oh, sorry. Uh, it was frozen. I mean, I, um, we, can, we 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 couldn't see. I uh, I hear your voices. I think. Um, how for how long? Uh, one uh, thirty second, one minute. I don't know. I uh, hear you mean this is it on this side or earlier. This Can I repeat? Ah, uh, yeah, this please. Time. Please repeat. Yeah. So, uh, can can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, wonderful! I I, I apologize. I think the must be due to the um uh, technical equipment in this hotel where I'm currently in that the internet is probably uh, not as as um as, as good as, as it, it should. Um, uh, but in, in I was talking about meta dominated um scenarios where. Um, say after the end of inflation, you could have another phase of meta domination, or it means another, you could have a phase of meta domination where, say, the inflaton um, decays into something heavy, and this heavy, is around, heavy particle is around for some time. And, and in this period, you could have large fluctuations that then collapse to, to black holes, and they would then be. Um, not as suppressed as, as in the radiation dominated uh, case. Um, here it's a bit different because you don't have pressure here, so then you have you know, the pressure stopping you, but you have deviation on spherical symmetry um, that leading to some um, suppression, uh, but it's, it's comparatively larger. Um, so another scenario, and please, if, if, I, if you don't hear me, just, just let me know, um, let me please, uh, please let me know um, immediately, then I, I can uh, sort of repeat, um, and um, my, uh, yeah, my, my, my sayings. So, and another one, probably the last one I'm now um, going through here is that it's a formation mechanism of primordial black holes by um, cosmic strings. Like I said, in, in the introductory slide of the formation scenarios, you could have closed string loops and these string loops can you know, come in their own Schwarzschild radius. And then you, uh, could form primordial black holes, and the spectrum seems to be, or is, is epoch um, independent. You forget the um, scale invariant um, spectrum for from from these uh, cosmic cosmic strings. I mean, these are I must say these mechanisms are now sort not to be sort of the uh, the most uh, they are not now the most discussed mechanism, but still they could uh, provide um, also the, the dark matter. Uh, or, or at least in, in certain parameter ranges. Um, now, one important um, aspect I want to uh, mention is, I want to bring up is non-Gaussianities. As I mentioned, primordial black holes are rare. And for instance, if you, even if you go for the maximum of dark matter, a, a maximum of primordial black hole abundance, which you can have, which is 100% of the dark matter, um, say for the sake of simplicity, all in tens of 20 grams, then it's only one 
and 10 to the 15 horizon patches that undergoes a collapse. So this is actually something extremely rare. And again, bring, let me bring up this cartoon, which is exaggerated because you would be much more in, in, the, in the tail um, here. So you, like I said, you're deep in, inside the tail. Now, since you're very deep into the tail, you're, you're very vulnerable in a sense to the occurrence of non-Gaussianities. And also you have a strong modal coupling between long and short wavelength modes. There was a paper by Burns showing that sort of um, long and short wavelength modes can, can interact in certain circumstances. And moreover, in, you know, by also these, these um, stochastic um, techniques in, in quantum diffusion and some refined statistical treatments um, indicate that this tail actually is not uh, really Gaussian, so, but it's exponential, which is still sort of, uh, it's still suppressed, but it, it's not as suppressed as, as um, it, it looked at the beginning. So that's some, some recent developments. Now, actually, ah, very good. And, and I will start now with, with a constraint um, a part, which uh, will be continued in the, in the second lecture. Now we have, and we talked about many aspects on the formation of primordial black holes, uh, many different scenarios and, and um, sort of what sort of mass distributions we, we may expect for the statistical properties. Um, but it's also, of course, important to, to see how could we possibly tell about uh, primordial black holes around or how could we possibly constrain certain mass ranges. In a sense, the notion of constraints is a bit Newer one, um, I think before the first um, experiments, the first observations that, that led to constraints now uh, reported on sort of uh, positive and unexplained um, events that, that they detected. So constraints is, is also to be seen as a sort of detection prospects in, in, in a sense. Now, uh, speaking about constraints, there's actually a whole plethora. Let, let me give you a sort of a cloud of, of overview. I mean, here where I'm, the weather is very sunny currently, so I don't want to make the sky too clouded, but actually this, I, <laughs> I will. So the most basic um, constraint is just by not overproducing them. You can't have more primordial black holes and there's dark matter. That is just the absolute maximum. The basic criterion that's not related to specific, say, microlensing observations. Um, then mentoring lensing. This is probably where most of the constraints come from these days when you have lensing that can have, can be either strong lensing, um, mostly micro lensing, milli lensing, nano lensing, femto lensing, all sorts of lensing events um, could, could, could occur. Very prominent one is gravitational waves. There are some constraints being posed by um, primordial black holes either merging uh, or you could, uh, for instance, imagine that there's a stochastic background, there's hyperbolic encounters, there's all sorts of gravitation um, wave effects that these black holes um, make. Then what has been um, mentioned at the beginning, namely that small black holes evaporate and those around 10 to the 15 grams should evaporate in the present epoch. And this of course should, um, if primordial black holes um, you know, constitute size effect of the dark matter, they should really um, generate enormous amounts of gamma rays and, and these are not observed. So you could limit the abundance, or you can limit the abundance of primordial black holes in this mass range uh, tremendously. Then very interesting, and the second part of lecture, we will talk about this one. If you have a two component dark matter scenario, say you have primordial black holes being a part of the dark matter and you have particle dark matter. And this is also sort of bringing together different uh, approaches to understand the dark matter. And, and I, I, sometimes I feel when people talk about dark matter, they're sort of, they're a bit narrow um, and, and, and I want, and, and also sometimes a bit hostile towards other uh, approaches and very different forms of dark matter, but this is sort of bringing together sort of uh, harmonically again, um, the, um, the ways or the possibility that you could have actually primordial black holes being some part of the dark matter. And then you have particles, say of WIMS, um, you have um, axon like particles, if there are neutrinos and whatnot. And what would happen, um, we will talk later more about this, but what generally happens, you get these particles forming a halo about primordial black holes. And then in terms of WIMS, they, they would 
lead to a large or enhanced inhalation signatures. And, and this could be observed and you could pose constraints or could look for, for these objects. There's even people looking for, for seismic waves, so either like um, earthquakes or moonquakes you could, could look for when they hit Earth or, or, or the moon. Um, there's disruption, all sorts of disruption events um, where primordial black holes basically could go into the center of neutron stars and, and eat them up. Um, and by, by us knowing that there are neutron stars around, uh, we could um, sort of try to limit the amount of primordial black holes. There's CMB distortions by, say, by accretion onto primordial black holes. You could, lead, uh, could, could uh, get a distortion of the um, cosmic microwave background, which um, you could use by, I mean, CMB is very well measured. You could use the CMB then to um, constrain this, uh, these effects. Usually it concerns more um, the larger masses. And there, there's many more. You see, there's a whole zoo of, of um, possible constraints that could be formulated depending on the mass range and the physics that are associated with it. Now, this is con a set of constraints that, that in, um, in, a, uh, in a work, by Bernard Carr, Marit Sunstead, and myself in 2016, where, which was sort of up to date uh, in, in this, um, um, at, at this time. And this is non appropriating um, black holes. This is for monochromatic mass spectra. So you have, again, the primordial black hole dark matter fraction versus the mass in grams in the low axis and the mass in solar mass in the, in the upper x axis. But, and, and there's, I can't go through all of these, but there's a, a micro lensing events, there's Newton star capture. There's, so this is from the evaporation even, um, and, and then it's, you have some white binary disruption and so on and so forth. But actually some limits are now thought not to be really there anymore. They, they, they're, they're based on assumptions which, which turn out not to be realized. For instance, the phantom lensing constraints, I think the, the finiteness of the source wasn't taken properly into account. Vision star capture constraints where Newton stars were destroyed by, um, primordial black holes that uh, hang into the centers um, of them and, and, and ate them up. And they, these, these articles assumed a uh, too large energy, uh, too large um, dark matter density um, in the environment that authors were looking at. And also um, this constraint got um, removed. I think I should sort of uh, wrap up soon. This is much more up-to-date constraint. I think there's, there's even more um, after later on, more detailed ones we will we'll show later on. That's the paper of uh, Bernard Carr and, and myself from, from um, 2020, so reviews. Um, again, it's uh, the primordial black hole dark matter fraction versus mass. And here you see different, um, yeah, different constraints. The microns and constraints, they got changed, but they sort of prevailed um, in a way. And you see also see different letters here, different numbers. And basically, all the dark matter is possible to even for monochromatic mass spectra to put in, in this window A, um, you can put part of the dark matter, not all, in, in the other windows um, also. But you should also keep in mind that mostly, um, and not on mostly for this, when I say you could put them in a window, this is a diagram for monochromatic mass spectra. In reality, what you will have is an extended mass spectrum. And the mass spectra that we believe that are most realistic are actually significantly extended over, over several orders of magnitude in mass. So you would uh, sort of have probably 10% at some mass, 5% somewhere else, and, and all this adds up or can add up to 100% of the dark matter. I just want to mention this also includes here um, a very large window. And of course, this is not thought to be um, this, I mean, this is window D, and the, but this is not thought to be explaining the dark matter saying rotation first because it's, it's too heavy to, um, to do this. But we figured out that there's actually an open mass window and that could be filled with so-called stupendously large black holes, which are called slabs, um, which acquired some media attention recently. Um, and of course, we see slabs, it's, it's in one needs to then debate how, which mass or which fraction of their mass comes then from really the primordial over density and which is then accreted later on. That's another debate. So of course, the, the masses which in the formation scenarios, uh, which we uh, talked about earlier, these are the initial masses and all these masses um, can um, 
significantly increase afterwards. Of course, heavier black holes um, should have more accretion, but nevertheless, you could have mergers, you could have accretion for basically all the black holes. So the, these, the initial mass distribution would get changed. And probably the last thing before I um, finalize for today is that actually, when you see these, these constraints, and you, you probably have seen uh, when you read about primordial black holes, these type of diagrams, these diagrams uh, look very densely packed, and they are densely packed. <clears throat> but actually, the, the physics that led to the formulation of these constraints are not active on all, on, on all at the same um, redshift, but rather they are sort of coming about at different, different redshifts. And you see, this is really a projection um, um, diagram. So when you, when you go to um, a diagram like this, or tomorrow we will talk more about what this sort of, which is the most detailed diagram in the paper by Bernard Carr and his Japanese um, collaborators. And um, this is really a projection of, of, um, of a di many different effects um, at different uh, redshifts. And I think by now we, we have, it's now 11 o'clock and I think it's a good time to um, finish um, lecturing for, for, this, um, for this first uh, Tuesday lecture. So thereby I, I hope I could, um, or I hope Bernard, uh, Karen and myself could convey uh, sort of a good introduction to primordial black holes and um, hope, you know, this is, um, um, the material has been sufficiently clear. And we, of course we are now um, around for, for answering a uh, question which we're happy to do. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the nice talk. So let's open it up for question or discussion. Any questions? Oh, I thank you very much for the really nice uh, lectures. I have a, uh, one question about this beta function. The, is the, the functional form of the beta, is, is, can you derive it or is, is it kind of ansatz? So you showed, uh, for example, the, in case of the, uh, the I think the N green proposed the uh, log normal distribution function, for example, which is different from the first uh, form shown by uh, Bernard Carr and uh, others. So, I mean, so, uh, so uh, this different uh, uh, functional form has some its own uh, how to how do you motivate or uh, should, should, in the beginning yeah. of the first lecture yeah. yeah you you motivated you gave some uh, qualitative argument for the details about this uh, in the second lecture florian said that the uh, this uh, what is a monochromatic function uh, form is not very good of, uh, approximation right Yes. Should, should I have a first go, Florian, and then you can follow yes, please, on? Uh, please, Bernard. Um, yes. I mean, the, the, the function beta, of course, depends entirely on the scenario you're, you're considering. If, if the fluctuations are monochromatic mm -hmm. and, and, and come from uh, inhomogeneities in the early universe, then the formula which Florian showed, the exponential dependence, is the one that applies. Mm -hmm. Now, but in other scenarios, you'll have a different formula. If the black holes form from cosmic strings, for example, then the yeah, probability yeah. of collapse depends upon the uh, the string parameter. If mm -hmm. if if you have the, the a dust phase in the early universe, which um, when the pressure is very very low, then the probability of collapse depends upon the 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 probability of having the asymmetry be, uh, because the point is you need spherical symmetry to collapse in that case and so the probability of collapse depends upon the probability of having a certain amount of uh, spherical symmetry mm -hmm. so in okay. general beta is entirely dependent upon the actual formation scenario 
Now, mm -hmm. Florian was talking about inflation, and right. in that particular case, uh, beta uh, depends on the, the, the form of inflation, and every single expression for, every single model for inflation will have a different expression for the oh. uh, beta M. I mean, if, for example, you have, you, if you have an inflationary scenario which simply produces a spike at a certain mass, then you'll mm. have an expression for the, uh, the beta, which depends on the inflation mm. parameters. If, however, your inflationary scenario just produced a blue spectrum, a continuous blue spectrum, you know, without a, a, a peak, which is one scenario, mm. then you'll have a different expression. Um, okay. So the fact is that any expression for beta is going to depend upon your particular formation scenario. <laughs> and inflation is just one of those scenarios, but it is the scenario that people tend to focus on most. Now, mm -hmm. but then uh, Florian also emphasized that uh, when you write down beta m, you're sort of assuming that it's monochromatic. But actually, as Florian emphasized, you don't expect to have a monochromatic mass function, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. if the even if the power spectrum is monochromatic, you don't expect to get um, a, a, a monochromatic mo mass function for the black holes because you have critical phenomena and you have non you know you have asphericity and things mm -hmm. like that. So. Uh, Although the early works assume it's monochromatic, it, it isn't going to be. So there's two issues. The, the first issue is, is the power spectrum of the fluctuations monochromatic? And then mm -hmm. the question is, even if it is, is the power spectrum, is the mass function of the black holes monochromatic? And the answer is to the second question is no. And the answer to the, the first question is probably no, because you don't really expect oh. a delta function for the power spectrum either. Now, the log normal mass function, which mm -hmm. uh, Florian mentioned, this seems to apply fairly generically in many um, inflationary scenarios in which you have a sort of peak. And any inflationary scenario which produces a peak in, at a, mm -hmm. a given mass scale is going to tend to generate a log normal mass function. Mm -hmm. if, if, you have a, if the inflation generates a, um, a blue spectrum, which of course is what I first talked about when I did the work with Jim Jim Lidsey, mm. and it's more complicated because you have the PBHs, and then then what tends to happen is uh, that you know you're only forming black holes at very at the end of the inflation basically, um, and so in that case I don't think the log normal function works, but in in the generic scenario where inflation produces a peak you tend to get the log normal mass function. But Florian, I'd like you can carry on and say, if I might have mistakenly stated something or you can clarify. No, I think this is, this is uh, I mean, brilliantly um, um, summarized and explained. I think it uh, uh, can hardly add anything. I just want to um, add, add one, one point. I mean, of course, uh, yet another point because you, you said there's, there's different, different, um, different steps. The first step is so, given we have an inflationary origin, mm. how does the how does say um, the primordial power spectrum look? Well, then you get a spectrum in the primordial power spectrum. This, mm -hmm. sort of, you know, these fluctuations, sort of, these, these scales leave uh, the horizon and re-enter again, and then, and the question is, and that's influenced by the critical collapse, which Bernard mentioned. How does this translate to um, a mass function of primordial black holes? But this is like I, I think I mentioned this a, a bit before. That is, you know, the initial mass function of primordial black holes. Of course, you know, and primordial black holes produced, um, which are around um, a solar mass, are produced around the QCD scale. So it's ten to minus five seconds after the Big Bang. So they are around for over ten billion of years. And in in this time, the mass function can and will significantly change. So you get, actually get these three steps from primordial power spectrum to re-entry till today. So I, I just want to make this point that you get sort of um, that, that this is sort of the spectra change on the way um, to, to what we observe today. <clears throat> but I think that, I mean, the, the main point is of, of all of both of these remarks is that you don't expect a monochromatic mass function. Yeah. I mean, even though, I mean, actually, of course, when I say monochromatic, I mean, that's, I mean, no one would expect exactly monochromatic anyway, but, but you might naively think you would have a, a, 
a mass function which was narrow in the sense that the spread delta m was of order m. Okay, uh, so and even that scenario is not really very likely. I mean, because uh, there are so many ways in which it's you, you, the spectrum will be spread a little bit more. So, and in fact, in the in the my first lecture on Thursday, I will I am going to talk about the various sort of mass functions which are expected for primordial mm -hmm. black holes. And, and, and there are many different, you know, critical phenomena is one of them, but they're, 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 and cosmic strings gives a mass function. So uh, you expect to have an extended mass function. And if you've got an extended mass function, then the question is, what do you mean by beta as a function of m? Because obviously beta as a function of m um, is going to reflect the mass function. Um, so and so the log normal mass function, which uh, Florian mentioned, only applies in a very specific context. It, it applies in, in, in inflation and, and indeed in a rather specific. I mean, it's quite general within a particular context of inflation, but it's not completely general uh, in, when you go to the broader range of, of phenomena. OK, thank you very much for your clarifying explanations. Yes. Other questions? Uh, if not, can I have one nice question? So you uh, introduced the, the three kind of series scenarios to generate the primordial black hole. So can we distinguish this uh, if we uh, detect a C, the primordial black hole, one primordial black hole, then can we say that this is from whence, uh, which scenario we, can we distinguish? Nothing. I mean, besides the mass distribution, kind of. Well, that's interesting because it depends exactly the context in which you see them. For mm -hmm. example, say you, we're going to argue later on Thursday that the most natural candidate for the dark matter is a solar mass primordial black hole. And so let's assume that we we do detect a solar mass black hole. I mean, we might detect it by gravitational lensing or through a gravitational wave. Uh, now, then the question is, where, what scenario is most likely to give a one solar mass black hole? Now, we will tell you next Thursday that the most natural scenario for that is one in which the black holes form at the phase transition, the QCD phase transition, because one solar mass is basically the horizon mass at the QCD epoch. Um, now, however, you still need to have fluctuations uh, in order to produce that PBH. So we would then say in that context, um, the most natural thing is that you're going to produce, um, you will have inflation generating the the fluctuations, but then because of the dip in the equation of state, this, the equation of state softens, the sound speed goes down at the Q to the epoch. So the most natural scenario is that the fluctuations come from inflation, but then they go through the QCD epoch, and that's when the black holes form because because it's easier for them to form then because of the exponential dependence on the on the sound speed. That's if it turned out to be a one solar mass black hole. If, however, you found the black hole had a different mass, um, you, you would you you would say, for example, you had a it turned out that the PBH was in the asteroidal mass range. I mean, say you detected an asteroidal mass range black hole by microlensing or something like that, or through some dynamical effect. You know, maybe you, you saw an asteroidal, uh, asteroidal mass black hole might, for example, um, swallow up a neutron star or, so, or something like that. Um, then uh, probably you would have to... Uh, Again, inflation, you could choose inflation. I mean, inflation will almost explain anything if you if you fine tune the power spectrum of the fluctuations. So inflation is probably always going to be a candidate. But most of those other candidates um, um, will have different clues. For example, if black holes form through cosmic strings, which was one of the scenarios Florian mentioned, then it's a feature that you expect black holes to form over every mass scale. So you expect to have a continuous mass function for the black holes. 
And so one of the clues will be in the mass function of the black holes. Well, so if you've literally only got one black hole, you can't say much. But if you have a mass function for the black holes, if the mass function turned out to be uh, a simple power law form, that, that comes out of forming them from cosmic strings. So that might be an argument that it comes from cosmic strings. Now, in the scenario we're going to talk about on Thursday, we actually have a, a very specific prediction for the, the mass function where it's got a series of bumps. It has about three bumps. So if you find out the mass function, the mass function with three bumps would tell you very specifically the scenario is correct. If you have bubble collisions, well, we know what phase transitions in the early universe are going to produce bubble collisions. It's when there's a symmetry breaking, but that will predict very particular mass scales. So if, for example, if it's the electroweak transition, you get one mass scale. If it's the grand unified transition, you get another, the gut transition, you get another mass scale. So again, if you had very specific masses, <coughs> which were associated with a, a, a breaking of symmetry, a phase transition in the early universe, that would be the most natural explanation. But I think maybe the common, the, the key point is that having just one detection at one mass isn't really going to give you all the information you want. What you really want is to have a few detections because then you've got a mass function and then the mass function is going to more or less determine the, the scenario pretty uniquely. And that is why the gravitational wave observations are so interesting because if LIGO, LIGO's now got a hundred black hole events, if you end up having a mass function for the black holes, uh, from LIGO, that, and if they're primordial, that's going to tell you almost uniquely what the mass function is, and hopefully it will be the mass function we're going to talk about on Thursday. Florian, do you want to add something? Um, uh, there, there's not too, there's really not, not much to add, but I think one, one aspect is also spin. Um, so you mentioned that the mass function at which, uh, so at which masses, at which mass spins, we observe a certain, a certain uh, number or number density of black holes, but also um, the, the the angular momentum of these black holes. It's difficult currently to for the individual black holes, say found by LIGO, to 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 um, um, really determine the spin. But for instance, I mentioned primordial black hole formation in matter domination. Typically, if primordial black holes are formed during a matter dominated phase, they would spin much more rapidly than than they are during. Um, uh, radiation dominated uh, phase when they are produced in there. So this is also um, um, a discriminative feature. But of course, I think ultimately it's, it's, it's you know, all the information that, that you could get, all the characteristics that you observe that would tell you then um, in which direction you have to look and probably uh, narrow down the class of, of models that are, you know, uh, could be responsible for um, the, the currently observed abundance. Mm. Hey, thank, thank you very and, much. And of course, we're gonna, and we already have information on spin from LIGO, of course. Yeah. Which seems to suggest they probably don't have the spin, and that's one of the arguments why primordial black holes may be favoured over the stellar black holes. I mean, I mean, really, the best hope is going to come from LIGO because <clears throat> LIGO will give us a mass dependence, a spin distribution, and it will also give us a redshift dependence for the coalescences. And if we find LIGO is producing coalescences at high redshift, for example, that will exclude ordinary stars and we'll, and we'll be forced towards primordial black holes. And of course, if LIGO gets a, a black hole less than a solar mass, it would have to be primordial. So that's another important point. If you get any black hole with a mass less than one solar mass, essentially it has to be primordial because you can't produce them in, in the late universe. So that's a sorry. That's we we've spoken at great length in response to that question, but it's a very interesting question. Uh, thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, if not, let's dance again to the speakers. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you again on. Thursday. Yeah. Yes. Bright, bye bright bye. and early. Bright and early for us, but <laughs> rather late for you. Yes. Okay then. Uh, bye, bye, bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Goodbye.
See you on Thursday. See you. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.